Hello, Stephen. Uh, we're here today for you to tell us your propaganda about why you hate seed oil so much and how you actually funded by, is it like small fat? Me, the, it's small it's farm the, fat? Um, no. the, meat, <laughs> the meat industry is funding me. <laughs> yes, the, the meat industry, the animal the animal fats industry is, is funding, is sponsoring this. <laughs> it's not sponsoring this. Or you should just tell us about why we're going to be talking about why seed oils and... Um, is it an overblown fad or legitimate concern? And this is just a general thing that a lot of people, I think, are talking about now. Just the concerns. For me, it's always been, eh, how exactly are you getting seeds? I mean, oils out of the seeds, kind of like the similar thing with, like, how are you getting milk out of, like, beans? <laughs> is it really a thing? There's just something very kind of suspicious about this and the history. And the more you kind of learn about these things, the more questions come up. And um, we've had personal experiences that we'll get into to of the benefits why we're changing this and for some people i think it's something that's interesting people and i'm glad that you're here to talk to us about this Stephen, because you've been doing a lot of work into this as you normally do with uh getting into different topics so tell us a bit about this sure so originally i got into this because i saw i mean i saw a lot of stuff on the internet and i kind of wondered like you know, is this some internet bros fad or is this like, is there some <laughs> legitimate concern concern to this? And if you look, you see in certain circles of the internet, people are talking about the dangers of seed oils, avoiding seed oils, seed oils being the cause of our problems, et cetera. So I thought, okay, let, let me look into this on my own, see if there's any legitimate information here or it's just overblown. So one thing that sort of caught my mind and as several of the critics have pointed this out, despite our knowledge and technology, we still have very high chronic rates of diseases around the Western world. Heart disease, cancer, obesity, diabetes are still major problems. One of our sources here, uh, Tucker Goodrich, pointed out animals are getting affected. 60% of dogs in the U.S. are now obese, which is just crazy to think. And I'm like, yeah, and I'm just like, I'm not, you know, I'm not an expert, but like something about this just doesn't just doesn't add up. Um, and I don't know, I would think we're getting to a point where more and more people just die of natural causes. I mean, obviously, sanitation, hygiene, vaccines, it's like, why are people dying of these issues? I mean, aren't a lot of these pre preventable by now? Uh, mm -hmm. Another unseen issue, for example, is uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which only started emerging in the 80s. We all know that if you drink a lot, your liver gets fatty and you have to basically stop. Your liver can burn the fat and regenerate itself, but you've got to give your liver a break. But they started discovering these old ladies started getting fatty liver disease and they found that they barely or never drank. So it's like, well, wait a minute, what's causing that? That's one potential thing. And then I would always emphasize that uh, heart disease is the number one killer on earth, especially in the West, in America, especially. And why is that such a big issue if we're told animal fats are the cause of the problem, but we've cut them out so much, yet heart disease is still the number one killer for men and women? Well, again, what else is causing that? And what has changed in the last hundred years or so? All right, uh, thoughts and comments before I continue? Yeah. So with this one, personally, with my experience, Experience with fats and things like this. I've had some general concerns, as I mentioned before. Have done some uh, research into this more when I was doing like the ketogenic diet, which did work for me. It's, it, I mean, it's just a thing where, of course, caloric deficit, this deficit, then switching your diet into ketosis, which is getting most of its energy from the stored fats and the fats that you intake. And uh, that's an actual thing. It's, it's the, this actual, this actual, I don't know, the same science is kind of. Of an overused term now that has been kind of ruined by the recent uh, pestilence and passed on viewers to science. But there actually is like clear scientific things where your body gets energy from different sources. And when you switch it to ketosis, it's getting energies from fats. So when I was doing that, I was always a fan already, even from before that, from using ghee and um, coconut oil. And those were my main primary oils in that. And that actually, there's an actual effect to that. But in the current in the current fat acceptance body positivity sort of environment where they talk about fat phobia i dislike that term cuz it's like oh i'm not afraid of that <laughs> that one brave and stunning large uh, <laughs> musician in performer in the United States of America that likes wearing these provocative outfits and start, starts talking about why you keep talking about me and then everywhere it's like brave and stunning and this and this I'm not afraid of that. Like I've I've found larger women to be attractive in certain ways. You do you might not want to do all, all sorts. Of, anyway, <laughs> but I think the fat phobia that they talk about there does kind of apply to something that has been in the actual dietary industry in the United States of America and many other parts of the world as well to just fats themselves. Just 
if anything has fat into it, it's horrible. We have to go to non-fat. We have to go to this and this. And you start finding out like, how much do we actually know about the foods that we're actually intaking? How much does our body actually, what is our, what are our different bodies used to actually getting from the different foods that we have? We have, we actually should even include this in our series of You Are What You Consume, which is a different series that we had on talking about restaurants, talking about foods, talking about different things. This is a topic that Stephen and I have a lot of interest in. As you can see, Stephen has lost some weight. I've also lost weight from being a recovering obese person. Um, I can do better with that. Stephen is on his journey as so well to do better in that. But we we all we both have um, a lot of interest in food and looking into different topics. And this is a topic that I think um, it's it kind of it kind of gripped me to just kind of understand like where did these things come from? Why do these things have certain perceptions in the world? Why do certain things come out? Like when you start finding out how these oils were developed and the process that goes through to actually create these oils, some of them were created for like industrial reasons rather than like consumption reasons. And like, oh, we can actually eat these things. So there's a whole lot of things that I think we'll get into. And I think there is an actual phobia of fats. And that is more from just not understanding what different sorts of the wide ranges of fats that are available, not understanding our history with these things. And of course, the marketing there from fat alternatives, or it's it's an industry, there's competition and things like that. There's biases, there's people who are just invested into one thing and they see it in a certain way. And we're not talking about this like, oh, we're complete experts on this. This is 100%. You have to do things the way we're saying it. We're saying these are things that we've experienced. These are things that we've learned. These are things that we prefer. And Unfortunately, had some freezing here, so we'll be recording some parts here. I was just saying it's all preferences, and we're interested in seeing what your preferences might be or your experiences have been. But the, uh, the what I was going to say is, uh, I re- I recently weighed myself. I'm down to 209. I've got a little ways to go. Um, I, I looked back though; my heaviest was 228, so that's about 20 pounds down. Again, got a little ways to go, but I'm pretty happy with my progress so far. Uh, one of our mm-hmm. sources here. Dr. Kate uh, Shanahan, we're gonna, she's going to come up a lot through this. Uh, she actually wrote a book called The Fat Burn Fix, which uh, I've, I've been reading as well. And um, she kind of advocates like a, a version of the keto diet, a little modified, because she explains that cutting out carbs all the way suddenly isn't good for you. And there's things like the keto flu where you can feel sick if you do it too soon. Uh, but she talks about yeah, winding sure. back carbs and then, and then uh, going into a state of ketosis and how – it's better for your body, but you also have more energy and mental clarity. Like your brain functions better on ketones rather than carbohydrates. And I think that's one reason I've probably had more energy and more mental clarity lately. Now, part of it's also I've cut drinking out almost entirely. Uh, so that could be a factor as well. But um, I do think there's something to burning your body's natural fat rather than carbohydrates, especially refined carbohydrates. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a, that's exactly what your body's doing when it's creating fat. It's yeah. absorbing the nutrients out there and storing it in easily accessible, like um, an easily accessible store of energy. That's what it's doing when it's storing fats. So it makes sense that if you actually find similar edible store sources of that store of energy out in nature, using those would make more sense than going and manufacturing these other ways to get fats out of seeds, which are have not stored <laughs> that nutrients in that form in their nature as a seed. Like some of the typical things, the human animal involved in nature to absorb nutrients from certain things in nature that were created for that purpose. So instead of doing a better job of just recovering what nature has already given us, we're going in and meddling and creating these new things. Um, thoughts and ideas behind certain things being looked at as positive and certain things being looked at as negative. And with obesity, thing, that's a clear thing that we can see. I, there's no other animal in nature that is existing outside of proximity or cohabitation with human beings that gets obese. It just does yeah. not happen. And no. this, it, it, it's 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 just a general sense of when people start talking about like hippos. Hippo is is supposed to be that way. That's, that's how the animal is evolved. It's it's not even, you can't even consider that fat. The hippos aren't fat. They're just hippos. That's just the way they are. Humans, we have a wide range of ways to be, but there is a way that a human being has evolved to be. It's like saying, oh, some people are born blind. It doesn't mean me saying blinding yourself, doing things that are going to blind yourself is just as healthy as just doing things that are going to keep your eyesight normal and you see that term normal just it's it's <laughs> there's just too much language in this where people are avoiding the reality of things and i think we can all be adults if you're probably listening to this content if you're in my 
channel that you've been here before. The text for coming back. I haven't been posting in a while. Steve has been busy with things. We'll probably be posting a bit more with our content, but I think we're making content for adults with adult conversations who can handle these things, who are looking to just understand more about the world. And I know some of this content might trigger some people. We're not here to offend people, but I'm also not out here to coddle people from just information. But yeah. Sure. Um, yeah, I was okay. going to say, um, actually, anything else in this first section? No, I was just I was just going to go into the next two sections. One of these, well, the, the second section is pretty brief, so I'm just going to go to that, then the next one, and then we'll I'll let you go again. Um, yeah, okay. I was going to say I checked our, our last conversation was early January, and here we are in May, so it's been almost half a year. <laughs> but um, okay, so initial impressions: Why are seed oils a bad thing? Haven't been people been eating uh, seeds and nuts for millennia? I was like, yeah, but there's more to the story than that. It's not simply squeeze oil out of a nut, seed, or fruit, throw it into a pot, and discard it. Although some of that's debatable. So then I wrote, why blame seed oils? Couldn't other things be to blame as well? Now, personally, I'm not ruling out other things as well. Like there's tons of problems with refined sugars. That's a mm -hmm. whole conversation in and of itself. I mean, probably do a whole separate video on that. Uh, Dr. Catherine Shanahan, one of our sources, she argues that when the oils and sugars are combined, they're especially devastating. So Shanahan's background, for those who don't know, it's biochemistry, nutrition, genetics. She also went to medical school. Uh, she was nutritionist for the LA Lakers as well as ran her own private practice. She's one of the people who has basically been spearheading this whole crusade. Uh, very good source of information, very obviously very informed, very intelligent, um, explains things in a very clear, understand, easy to understand way. Uh, the other thing that I've thought of, too, dyes and preservatives. Some people talk about dyes being linked to cancers. I mean, I don't I'm not well versed on that science, but it kind of makes sense. Certain preservatives, because it's like you think about it. Things are meant to expire naturally. If you keep things lasting way beyond yeah. their shelf life, that's not good. It's probably not something that's good for you. Um, like, for example, uh, Tucker Goodrich, one of the sources that a post on his Twitter about how they used to put wax on vegetables to make them last. And it's like, that's not really stuff you should be eating. Uh, apples, commonly. So another thing. thing so I, where there's, there's a recent thing that I was listening to. I think it was on the Dark Horse podcast with uh, Heather Hay and Brett Weinstein. Yeah, they were yeah. talking about some thing where they're, they're – because it's an organic process to put the, the sort of cuticle wax thing onto the fruit, it's being considered organic even though they're using a manufacturing processing method to actually create the stuff on it. And that's to me, has just been a suspect thing. Like I, from my background, grew up – I was born in France, moved to Kenya – they lived in America, then came back to Kenya, lived in Italy for a bit. So seeing the way people in different countries treat food has been an eye-opening experience for me. That's something I've just learned for myself. And also my mom made sure when we were growing up, wherever we were, to have like a garden, a farm. So we'd actually see like straight from farm to table, get a seed, put it in the ground and see how the food comes. And you compare it to that to what you'd find in stores. Like this I think I keep repeating over again. It's like this one time when I was living in San Francisco with a friend. Um, I was going back and forth between San Fran and Nairobi. We got some apples from Costco and um, left them in the fridge. They're just in the back of the fridge. And I remember coming back to Kenya for a couple of months and coming back and then same apples were in there. And it was just, it still had the same look on the outside, but you touch it and it's just kind of like empty. And so slowly by slowly it was just decomposing. But to keep, what what was the thing we were actually eating to begin with? What did we purchase and begin with? We, we did not per purchase an actual organism that has nutrients. It was more of just like some sort of thing frozen in time. <laughs> like, and these things that we do with our food, it's it's strange to me that some of the people who are very into organic foods in a positive way to say we want whole foods, we want things that are as natural as, as possible, just from the earth, the access to that way, the way nature has given it to us don't really seem to extend that all the way to fats. I don't know, from your experience, what, what, what do you think the disconnect is, or am I wrong and there is as much um, crossover into well, it? Well, well, I'll get into this below, but I think a lot of it's the marketing. I mean, even the term vegetable oil is meant to make it sound healthier than it yeah. is, but it's like, you know, we'll get into how it's made, but it's not take a piece of broccoli, squeeze the oil out, throw it into a pot and cook with it. If that were the case, I'd be like, okay, fine. Um, but I think it's a combination of, the companies that make this pushing it hard, they fund certain things, there's lobbying, uh, the demonization of animal fats, which again is misguided. Uh, you know, we'll get into all this, but I think I think in general it's just a lot of misinformation. And and I was saying to someone like, I don't think this is some nefarious conspiracy. I think it's just a combination of 
Mm -hmm. These oils, they're cheaper, they're easy to produce, they're easy to store, they have a long shelf life, they're neutral tasting, all that. And it's just like a lot of restaurants see, well, I can order tons of vegetable oil, it's cheap, I can store it, I can use it till it turns black, I can throw it out, that's fine. Whereas like tallow, okay, I'll have to refrigerate, I can use it once or twice and I have to throw it away, it can get rancid. So, you know, it, it's just generally people acting in their self-interest. I mean, I don't, I don't think it's like some plot to poison the public or anything like that, you know? <laughs> Yeah. 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 It's people, people find things that, yeah, there was, there was a time when doctors were suggesting m mother smoke or drink while they, they weren't like this sort of, it wasn't big alcohol, and big tobacco going in and trying to like infiltrate, but it was just people were doing that. Yeah. And yeah. Okay. Go ahead, continue. All right. So um, some people have attributed the weight gain to pollution, you know, there we go with climate change again. And my my point on that is always the world is cleaner than it was 150 years ago. Like if you look at footage of New York, even from the 60s and 70s, yeah. there's obvious smog in the sky. That's not the case anymore. The Hudson used to be full of sludge like uh, GE used to just dump their junk into it. Uh, the Thames River. Uh, if you ever played one of the Assassin's Creed games, it takes place in Victorian London and the Thames River is basically sludge, which is accurate because the comp the all these factories would just dump their junk right into the river and people living side by side with the river just died of typhus and other things because it was so unsanitary. Um, there's a political there's also cartoon. countries in the world right now that are just a lot more, uh, sorry, there's countries in the world right now that are a lot more pop like polluted than the average American city that do not have the obesity rates that America. Yeah. And, yes. uh, if you, there, I think I mentioned in a previous conversation, but there was a political cartoon about the mother and daughter eating outside in a restaurant in the city. And the mother tells the daughter, hurry up and eat your soup before it gets dirty. Because at that point in time, there was soot and stuff in the air that would actually land in food you were eating. So, and, and remember, remember, people were a lot slimmer back then. So it's like, by this logic, people should have been fatter back then and slimmer now. Obviously, that's not the case. Um, the fattest yeah. country on Earth actually is a uh, remote island in the South Pacific. It's called Nauru, and uh, several other remote uh, Pacific islands follow Samoa. Like that's where the Rock his family is from, and all that. And obviously, these are remote islands in the middle of nowhere. So it's like, yeah, maybe there's some plastic washing up on shore, but they don't have factories billowing smoke there and all that. Uh, smoking mm -hmm. has been vast. Smoking has been vastly reduced, like public smoking in public places used to be common. You just brought up about doctors. I always think of the scene early on in Forrest Gump where he's getting his leg brace fitted. The doctor actually has a cigarette in his mouth like that kind of behavior yeah. is common. Uh, even even my job, uh, Susan, that woman who's worked there 20 years, there used to be ashtrays in the front part of the restaurant. She used to have to clean this out. She used to have to clean them out. And the thing was, the restaurant opened in 98. So like this wasn't that long ago. And uh, you know, airplanes also in airplanes, that's a, the no smoking side was there because yeah. when planes were being built, like people used to smoke on the planes. I think even restaurants here in Kenya, people still smoke in, in uh, probably half the restaurants will like, especially bars will have like a smoking section, not like the one where it's like an enclosure where you have to go to like some exterior place, but just like in the place itself proper. Yeah. 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 And um, they said grocery stores used to have ashtrays in them. Uh, I know there was a smoke. <laughs> yeah. It's like, like I, I've talked about how my parents said they hated going to bars because there'd just be like a cloud of smoke and they'd come home and they would just smell like smoke and they neither of them smoke. Mm -hmm. So it, to them, it's disgusting. Uh, so obviously there's way more smoking. I mean, here now, I think in the city, there's a few cigar lounges, but it's like you have to have a special permit and advertise it as that. And there's a whole you know requirement and everything. Um, it's funny because some so of the younger people. What you're telling me is you come from a tobacco phobic family. That's just been always phobia, having this phobia against people who smoke. Because there's nothing about like healthy lungs. You can't really say that. Most people who smoke, like 99.99% of people who smoke don't get cancer after all. So all these things are these negative effects tied to smoking. Like, why, why are you talking about this? Why can't people just be happy? Why can't people just appreciate the smell and the bouquet of someone who's smoking cigarettes? Like, it's, it's, like, these languages, the way we talk about certain things, I just don't understand because people just don't accept that language about similar things. And then, ugh. It's very annoying. Well, I, I was going to say, too, um, it's funny. Some of these younger people I'm working with now, like one of our hostesses was uh, born in 1999. Like my I mean, my youngest brother was 97. So it's like we we're mm -hmm. talking about smoking in restaurants. And I'm like, I think when you were born, that's like when it started to go away. And like, I still remember smoking and not smoking. Yeah. But my parents can tell you everyone just sat side by side. And then the teachers smoking and every. Yeah, it's crazy. Um so again, heart disease is the number one killer. Um, despite cutting out all this, 
Uh, this is a quote from one of our sources here. Um, the name is uh, Dr. Sally uh, Fallon uh, and Mary and Nig. They wrote a book called Nourishing Traditions, which is a lot of the ancestral diet uh, stuff. They cite the work of uh, Weston Price is his name. He was someone who went to all these remote civilizations, studied the people and saw why are they healthy? Why are all these people on natural diets they have? They're tall, they're thin, they have perfect teeth, they don't have tooth decay, all that. Like what 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 could we find in common? And it was interesting too because it was people in all these different parts of the world, like different tribes in the Amazon, tribes in Africa. Um, I forget what they're called, but it's like – the Irish equivalent of the Amish, basically, like they have like people who still live like that, like all these people in remote areas of the world disconnected, they all have similar outcomes. And he was trying to figure out why. And, you know, a lot of it is the ancestral stuff. So here's what here's what they wrote. If, as we have been told, heart disease is caused by a consumption of saturated fats, one would expect to find a corresponding increase in animal fat in the American diet. Actually, the reverse is true. During the 60-year period from 1910 to 1970, the proportion of traditional animal fat in the American diet declined from 83% to 62%, and butter consumption plummeted from 18 pounds per year to four. During the past 80 years, dietary cholesterol has only increased 1%. During the same period, the percentage of dietary vegetable oils in the form of margarine, shortening, and refined oils increased about 400%, while the consumption of sugar and processed foods increased about 60%. So, you know, that that should be kind of tell you, OK, cutting way back on animal fats, yet these problems got worse. You know, that should at least raise some alarm bells. And I wrote here, if you go back and look, people are not dying on mass from heart attacks and heart disease. You know, heart attacks did happen. There's evidence that the ancient Greeks, Romans, whoever knew who they were, like they talk about people getting pains in their chest and falling over. So there's evidence that they did happen and they knew what they were, but it wasn't some common occurrence in, in 19, in the 1920s, an intern at Harvard named Paul Dudley White developed a machine called the German electrocardiograph, which would find arterial block. He was basically told, don't bother, focus on something more profitable. There's no real demand for this. So and again, you go further back, most people died from infectious and respiratory diseases like tuberculosis, smallpox, typhus, chlorella, different infections like Calvin Coolidge's son in the 20s fell on a tennis court, tennis court scraped his knee. Um, he actually got an infection and died from it because back then there were no antibiotics and sanitation wasn't as good, all that. Uh, but now a lot of that stuff has been tamed because we have better sanitation, better hygiene, vaccines, all that, whatever your thoughts on vaccines. So it's like, you know, a lot of those things have been tamed, except in either very poor parts of the world or, you know, in certain unsanitary areas. Um, now, some people have argued the higher rates of heart attacks and heart disease are because it's because people are living longer, they're easier to identify. To a certain extent, that may be true. People's organs do deteriorate over time, but this type of failure isn't as common. I mean, why are all these 40, 50-year-olds getting heart attacks? It doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, it's estimated that the rate of heart attacks increased about 200-fold between 1901 and 1962. Again, I mean, that's a hell of an increase. Um, now, while refined sugars are another serious problem, are, is the issue carbohydrates? And I wanted to sort of get into some of the points on that. Uh, did you have any thoughts before I talk about carbohydrates? Yeah, with this, as we've mentioned at the start, there's a lot of things that go into these different things with health and things. So we're just pro pro providing certain information based on this. Because one of the common things that I just know is as you have technology improving, you have situations where in the past or in other countries, if you had a certain sort of ailment or a certain, even it's like a simple allergy to like beans, in most countries, most time in the, in the past, you'd probably die as a child from that small allergy yeah. or from some certain condition. Or your parents wouldn't, if you wouldn't, you wouldn't be healthy enough to actually grow up to reproduce. And you have countries where some of those things are now dealt with through different medical interventions and things like that, which is a positive thing. The more humans alive, the better. In my general estimation, that's just my general stance on that. So you have more people reproducing. So some people who might have had weaker hearts in the past, when f fitness used to still be more selective to just how physically healthy are you to actually survive in any environment. In more advanced countries, I think you have people with weaker physiologies who are making it to a higher level of life, so a higher age in life. So you might have situations where they're actually being um, subjected, where they're actually higher rates of people who are weaker. Where, For example, if you are a 50-year-old in the countryside of some African village, chances are you're not going to have allergies to like pollen <laughs> because that thing would yeah. have weakened you yeah. as a kid and that that would have been out but as a someone living in the west there's people who literally have to have like 
inhalers daily, like just on the inhalers, because like just a tiny bit of pollen can get them in a cough where they just wouldn't be able to actually function. But they still have functioning lives because of the medical interventions. So I think there's some of that which you can also understand. Also things that, <laughs> like with the air conditioning that we just talked about. How even for me when I have when I breathe in air conditioning, I don't know if it's an evolution thing with my Luya genes from like the Western Kenya type of thing, where some things just seem I just don't I don't really I like the winter, but I don't really do well breathing in air conditioned air. Like it just makes me ill. But here in Kenya, you don't need an air conditioner. We just don't have air conditioners in houses. Just the dry heat and things. So there's there's other aspects like that where you might say there's some things that lifestyle in the West has added. <clears throat> also, some it's where life in the West has given certain weaker physiologies the ability to live and then they're more subject to certain things. And then, of course, there's other ones that we add to the diet, which, as we mentioned uh, when we were talking about this, when you decided to go off of the seed oils, we do, Stephen has been researching this for a while. He's been living this actual life, leaving it to so he's got to keep telling us the benefits that he's had from actually uh, leaving seed oils behind. I was also thinking I want to get back to that since I've done the keto, I kind of fluctuate in my diet. So let's go back to that as well and cut those out. I want to have like my fried french fries for once and then, and then cut them up because you're getting the actual oils that are not the seed oils here are generally more expensive. And then I finally went in and looked and I found out that the majority of even the liquid oil that Kenyans use here, the, the oil that's even used in margarine here, is not a seed oil, it's palm oil, which is yep. one of the oils that it doesn't have as many of the negative effects. And that's the diff depending on the country that you're in. Most of the foods, we hardly have any foods here in Kenya that are sweetened with corn syrup. Yet in America, if you're not getting something that's certified or organic or just completely natural, you're going to have the corn syrup. It's, it's not even like talking about different foods, the same food, like you, got, you get the Coca-Cola here, it's cane sugar. You get that same Coca-Cola in, in the United States of America, it's corn syrup. Like those are the things that that kind of bug me more. Like why does that get into? And I guess we'll get into it later. The differences between why palm oil, why olive oil has a profile that's considered positive by some, but corn and other kinds of oils like that don't. Okay. So I was gonna say regarding the AC, it's funny because we used to laugh at how my grandfather would blast the AC like to a point where it was almost uncomfortable. And um, yeah. I remember like my dad it, during the summer in his house, my dad would put a hoodie on because the house was so cold. And with my <laughs> grandfather, well, with my grandfather, he was pretty much all German. Like he was originally blonde and blue eyed. And like, so, I mean, his ancestors did come from a colder climate, but it could also have been his diet and other things like uh, we'll get into it. But the, a lot of the people who eat a lot of the fried stuff, they said they actually feel hot. And that has to do with how the body breaks down polyunsaturated fats. Uh, so there could be some of that. Um you know, and there's also, again, there could be a genetic component. Like they lived in New Orleans for a bit when my mom was a kid. And they said it was hell to them because it's not just hot, but it's humid because it's below sea level. So like they say you basically go into the water, you feel exactly the same because it's so humid. Whereas they also lived in the Mojave Desert. Um, I don't know if you have my mom as a friend on Facebook, but she went, they were in California recently. And uh, she was born in 29 Palms near Palm Springs. And uh, they said it was like the Mojave Desert. It was a dry heat, so it was pleasant. So it was like 90 mm -hmm. degrees there was fine. But 90 degrees in New Orleans, it's like you just feel everything because of the humidity. So there could be some of that aspect as well. Um, uh, so as far as cutting changes in the diet, yeah. uh, I cut out um, I cut out the oils. And this is actually a major turning point for me was that this was actually when I quit uh, drinking pretty much entirely. Because, uh, you know, mm -hmm. some people have asked me, oh, did you stop drinking because you're in a happy relationship? You're more... <laughs> on track well no 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 but but i but i would but i would make the point but no no but i would make the point that when i i got serious about quitting drinking that was about when i was with christine for a year or so so it's like that doesn't really hold water because it's like you know i didn't feel inclined to drink like early on it took a while but then the question like one thing i observed is when i cut out the oils i would get out of like i used to get out of work and be like oh i need a beer or whatever when i when i stopped eating the oils i'd get out of work i didn't feel that need anymore and then my mother went through a similar thing where she cut out the oil oil she's like i don't crave junk food anymore so there is something to this i think um you know again we're two people this is anecdotal genetically we're obviously related but i just wondered i'm like why don't i feel inclined to drink now and then i noticed like 
uh, I mean, the only alcohol I've had lately, I'll have like a sip of wine at work, like if we're tasting it because it's something we're offering. Uh, one day it was this was like maybe a month ago or something. I had two beers. I woke up with a headache the next day. And the thing was like I used to drink more than that, like regularly. So and a friend made the comment. He's like, you're just feeling the damage it's doing. But because you're healing, you're start. It's like you're more aware of it now. And um, yeah. And there's and I mean in general I tend to watch my sugar. I mean I I've been drinking coffee black like for years now. Um you know we have the occasional sweets like Christine got that tarragon soda. I don't know if you saw I posted a video with that. Um that's cane sugar not high fructose corn syrup. It's made in Eastern Europe so I like it actually it has a very strong tarragon flavor. It's nice. Tarragon's one of my favorite herbs. So like here and there uh she got these Polish cookies. Uh no seed oil. They're made with peanuts. They're kind of uh they're not as sweet. So like I'm not against sugar entirely just in little doses here and there but during the week i try not to eat too much of it um what else uh of course i avoid anything that has high fructose corn syrup uh i was saying too when i when i eat lots of sugar i tend to feel terrible especially around the holidays like the holidays i tend to have plum pudding the stolen bread things like that and like if I eat like that for a week or so, I just feel terrible. And then when I cut it out, I feel good again. Um, it's a similar with the oils as well. Uh, so then I, I wanted to get a bit into uh, countries with high carb diets. Do you have any thoughts before I jump into that? Or yeah, with that, with that one, I also have. Uh, you can also tell them about that app that you have. At least this is yeah. again the positives. If you're living in a city like New York, it might not really apply to like some smaller cities. But then you'd also be able to find other ways around. Tell them about that app that. that uh, so there, there's actually there's actually um, there's actually two apps I've been using. Um, one of our mutual friends uh, recommended this called Yuka, which you can actually scan uh, grocery items and it'll tell you uh, does this have oils? Because some things are kind of vague. Like I've actually seen a few items that just say oils, but that can mean mm -hmm. you know a multitude of things. Uh, but there's also the Seed Oil Scout app, which um, which I've been using. I want to check out some of the restaurants listed here, and it, it's pretty good because it's it's. Uh, I guess it's sort of crowdsourced, like the idea is that people can add what they want to it and then you can decide like, all right, are these restaurants good or bad? So there's certain pizza places that will use exclusively extra virgin olive oil. Uh, there's this restaurant called Hearth in the East Village. I used to walk by a lot. They only use uh, butter, beef tallow or uh, olive oil. Um, and then there's other restaurants that are more mixed, like, you know, that you can do substitutions. Like, for example, I used to go to Minetta Tavern a lot. I mean, we did videos on that and they cook some of the dishes yeah. with clarified butter. So I was thinking like, oh, OK, you order things that aren't deep fried or I was wondering, could you ask them to cook things in clarified butter? Or like little things like that where, OK, if you modify things slightly, you can avoid that. Um, there's other dishes. Um, there's there's like there, there's different ratings I have to check here. Let me see. There's like dine. It's like dine fearlessly. There's like dine cautiously. There's like avoid at all costs. Like everything has oil in it. Um, there's some places that are sneaky because they fry they fry in like fries and tallow, but then they'll give you mayo which has canola oil. But like it's good because people can add, so we can sort of inform each other and like. Oh, I spoke yeah. like someone will write. Oh, I spoke to them and they said we could do this. So I recommend if you eat here, get this. So it, it's it's very good. Everyone's kind of helping each other a little bit. Yeah, what is it here? Dine fearlessly, no seed oils on premises. Uh, dine cautiously. Many dishes contain seed oils. Um, what else here? Um, dine happily. Most dishes are seed oil free. Substitutions rarely required. Mm. Um, yeah, I'm trying to remember. Oh yeah, so like. Yeah, hearth here is dying fearlessly and some of the owners will explicitly say we're anti-seed oil we only use these things so it's good i mean i think we're all sort of communicating we're informing each other uh somebody even came into babo the other day and asked so i can see this is starting to spread around which is good i mean i think people are waking up and i think uh longer run it's going to help restaurants are going to get smarter and healthier and um you know i think it's just going to be yeah. better overall yeah Information yep. is helping. And this is the thing, like, we're not here advocating for some centralized government body to come in and man this and and uh, fund yeah. this other thing. It's just sharing the information out there and let people be more educated in what ex they're actually consuming and what they want. And Because like, this is certain things, like, if you actually look at what alcohol does, and alcohol is illegal, whereas things like marijuana, whether you like it or not, is illegal, tobacco is legal. So you look at these things like, is it really for your health or are there a lot of other extenuating circumstances for why certain things are considered legal and certain things are considered you can advertise this and certain things are put in these different positions. So I think with this, there's ways to develop and actually just have people be uh, more informed.
informed about what they're consuming, how the people who want to do things in a certain way find the people who want to consume things in that certain way. And I think that's just like a general positive thing. And hopefully this series, it's probably going to be a couple of videos to get this out, will be just part of this helping part of that series if we've had the URL interested in things that we intake and the things that we don't. And we're not really saying this like it's going to change your mind immediately. This information I had about smoking cigarettes long before I decided to stop smoking cigarettes. Information I had about drinking alcohol long before I decided to stop drinking alcohol. Information I had about the things, the food I was eating to get me to the obese state that I was long before I decided to actually change your race. So this is just like adding information and nothing we're saying is completely written in stone. If you all have information to counter or things that we left out, please let us know and we'll be appreciative for that. But yeah, so tell us yeah. about the carbs now. And uh, I mean, we are, we obviously advocate freedom. If you want to eat these oils, go ahead. I won't stop you. I mean, I ate them for years. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying, based mm -hmm. on what I'm finding, I recommend you don't. And it's like cutting them out was a major turning point for me as far as losing weight, cutting back alcohol, all that. So it's like, I'm hoping to kind of share that with other people if I can. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So regarding regarding carbohydrates, uh, one of our sources, Tucker Goodrich, um, he mentions that there are people on the planet who have had high carb diets and they don't have the issues that come up. So, for example, the Japanese historically, before many Western items were introduced, they ate around 84 percent of their calories from carbs and they had very low rates of heart disease, obesity, diabetes, etc. <clears throat> there was another um, Pacific, South Pacific Island group called the Tuca Santa. Um, historically, they've eaten ninety four percent of their calories from carbs, including lots of sweet wow. potatoes. So obvious, yeah, so obviously a lot of natural sugar there, but very low rates of obesity, uh, very low rates of heart disease. They say they essentially don't get diabetes. So it's like, well, okay, if you're eating natural sugar is not getting diabetes, I mean, what does that tell us? Um, so if carbs in of themselves cause this problem, they wouldn't be so healthy. Now, that being said, I mean, I'm still in sort of the low carb keto friendly kind of kick, but like, this is illustrating it is possible to eat carbs and have good outcomes. Some of it, there may be a genetic element at play here too. I mean, who knows? Um, Indians tend to eat more carbs, uh, but you know, we found out this is actually where diabetes was first discovered. They estimate about 2,500 oh. years ago. Uh, Indians have switched from ghee to seed oils. They're starting to get some of the same problems we have. Um, and then here's an interesting point. Uh, this is from... Um, Nourishing traditions. People in northern India consume 17 times more animal fat, but have uh, an incident of coronary heart disease seven times lower than people in southern India. So the southern Indian diet's almost entirely vegetarian, but since they've been eating some of these oils, they're starting to have more problems as well. Um, so again, what's the common ground? And they've been looking, what do these civilizations eat right before everyone starts getting sick? It's like, well, the refined sugars, the oils, etc. Now, are there any civilizations that eat high amounts of these oils and end up healthy? Not that we know of. Again, sesame oil has been used in India and the Far East, but that's where diabetes was discovered. So there's something called the Israeli paradox. I don't know if you've heard about it, but um, basically the Israelis eat large amounts of seed oils, mostly for economic as well as religious reasons, um, and, but they have all these issues. In fact, they've actually tracked Jewish groups Excuse me. Um, that have gone from other countries. I think they studied Ethiopia, uh, Eritrea was one, Somalia I think was another. Um, they've actually ate more animal fats, and then when they started adapting the Israeli diet, they started developing some of these problems. And the Israelis do basically everything they say because you think about it, they don't eat pork, so there's no lard. Uh, they can have beef tallow, but it has to be kosher. Uh, they use schmaltz, which is uh, from fowl, typically chicken, but it's like they tend to eat more vegetable oils because they're cheaper and all that, yet it's like they have these problems. And the Israelis, as far as I know, tend to be fit. I mean, they all have military service, all that. So you have to ask, well, again, why is there the problem? Now, this is a reference to the French paradox. The French historically eat lots of meats, cream, saturated fats more generally, but they have lower rates of heart disease, obesity, diabetes. Now, there's a region... Gascony is kind of, it's kind of like Siberia. There's no hard border to it. It's just kind of a general area that's shifted depending on the time. Um, it's famous for duck and foie gras. I was thinking like if I were French, I'd probably be from Gascony because they eat a lot of duck. They cook in goose fat and they eat foie gras. Um, they actually have one of the lower rates of heart attacks in the country. And um, despite eating this, and they've actually said that the French have started again having more problems since they've been eating the oils as well as processed foods. Um, they do also consume a lot mm -hmm. of sugar, and historically they've smoked a lot. I don't know if they still do, but you know you can point to that causing a lot of problems. <laughs> um, well, the yeah. thing is, there's also another book I uh, I bought yesterday. Uh, Shanahan co Shanahan co-authored it with another lady. Uh, it's called The Bordeaux Kitchen, and it sort of ties. Um, 
it, it's sort of it's about French ancestral cooking, and they talk about the regional stuff and why the French are healthy, and they talk about region by region. And one, and I think it's Alsace. They cook in a lot of lard because it borders Germany. Germans use a lot of pork. The Southwest they use a lot of uh, goose and duck fat. In the southeast corner, they use a lot of olive oil, Provence, because of the Italian influence. And they talk about again why the French are healthy. There was that other book, Why French Women Don't Get Fat. They get into Lots of natural fats, which um, you know are more safe, which make you feel full. Uh, they tend to walk and bike a lot. Um, they tend to eat the bigger meal earlier and burn off the extra. There's a, there's a lot of different factors, but there's definitely something to this. And Shanahan, I think, makes the comment: it's not when you understand this stuff, it's not really a paradox. It's no, this makes sense why these people are healthy. It's just we've fallen so far from it that it seems like a paradox now. And it's fair to say that carbs in of themselves don't cause diabetes. Again, there are these groups that eat a lot of carbohydrates, don't get diabetes. There was an experiment, and again, this you can kind of take with a grain of salt because nobody injects soybean oil into their blood vessels, but they found that they injected soybean oil into uh, the bloodstream. It actually induced insulin resistance, which caused diabetes. But then in another experiment, they injected olive oil, and it didn't cause the same problem. So you have to ask, again, why would it do that? I mean, again, nobody injects the oil directly into their veins, but you have to ask, why is it even if, if you were to flood your veins with olive oil? <laughs> but, you, but you have to ask, even if you flood your veins with olive oil, why isn't there the same problem as the soybean oil? So that, that does raise questions. Yeah. Okay, thoughts and comments? Yep. <laughs> See, it's kind of timeline. I'm sure the fact that you've stated it means that somebody somewhere is doing it seriously or is about yeah. to. I'll be some YouTube video right now, like somebody's like, I'm injecting all kinds of oils straight in my body. But, <laughs> um, did, you, did Mexico come up in this little research? Because I think like Mexico City, at least urban uh, people in Mexico, that's one of the most obese places in the world now as well. And they have a history of like <laughs> racism with corn and like tortillas and chimichangas and things like that. So they, they have a, a history of carbs. But then just recently, they've just blown up in size. Here in Kenya, you can already see the people in the urban areas, they're more obese. But then the people who are more like middle class and lower class who walk a lot more, as I mentioned, the typical oils that we use here are palm oil is the typical, is the most used oil that I found. Ghee is not like a regular thing they can find. Um, you start tasting like sesame oil, but I'm just even thinking like just going to a regular store and finding corn-based oil is not something that you really find. But then people eat a whole bunch of maize, like a typical thing. One of the staple foods is like ugali, which is a kind of like a maize meal, just like boiled water and maize. So maize is a common thing, just corn off the cob, like people like uh, this is roasted corn. So corn is a common thing people eat. People eat a lot of barley. People there's there's, there's carbs sort of. Beans and uh, corn and gideri is like a typical meal here. Uh, there's one thing called irio or mukimo, which is just like green peas, potatoes, uh, corn, and uh, cilantro or some other greens. Sometimes they put onions or carrots in different ways. But like that's like a common thing that people eat. But of course, they also uh, exercise a lot more. It's not the typical, you have to have like the full three meals a day type of things. Uh, things like juices, sodas, a very low intake of those. But then now you look people in the more urban areas who have the typical i'm going to sit at home in in my plush house get my food delivered or get certain food processes or have other people prepare the food for me like house help and things like this and then i'm going to get in my vehicle drive to work sit in an office do the same thing there go out for the lunches and things like that i'm going to be drinking a lot more you can see there's an obesity explosion in a certain community in the mid upper middle class middle class and, and above those of the people who are getting more obese. So it, these kind of things you kind of see that that we have to be blind to actually not realizing this. And these things are relatively new. It's relative to actually study these things, actually have enough ability to collect enough information from a long enough time of a wide enough range of people and start actually connecting some of these things together. I think the things that we take for granted as a society in general about, oh, this is the science of this. This is a, a agreed on information. This We just figured out what germs were. Like, <laughs> in our life, it was like, was it like 100? What was the germ theory? Was it, was it, eight, it might have been the 1800s, so, so yeah. not in our lifetime. So I was going to get into, uh, I'll get into below the difference between eating straight corn versus um versus corn oil, how that impacts the body. Uh, regarding Mexico, I don't think I had heard about that. Um, it's interesting though, because I, I was looking on the seed oil scout and I found a uh, taco place that only uses butter and beef fat. I might check them out. Um, they do, you know, the usual Taco Tuesday, or I think there's like a mix and match Monday or something, you know, prices are reasonable and they have some good flavors. They do different quesadillas, tacos. Um, 
I might, you know, I might take Christine there. I mean, it's reasonably priced, and they have some like interesting looking stuff. Uh, they have some pork dishes. She doesn't eat really like pork, but I mean, there's you know beef and vegetables too. So maybe check that out. I'm wondering too with Mexico, depending which part of the population. Um, again, it could be a financial thing. Maybe cooking with the oils because they're cheaper. Uh, importing a lot of you know refined sugars and things. Um, you know, it, it's it's hard to say. I mean, it's a whole thing about. I want to go to America and see a place where the poor are fat. But again, it's like the cheap food is the worst for you. Uh, and Shanahan even mm -hmm. makes that point that if you eat healthier in a way, long run, you'll probably save money because if you're eating filling, yeah. but if you're eating filling, but natural food, it's like you'll be healthier. So you won't have to go to the doctor and pay for stuff. But also if you feel full, you'll eat fewer calories. And I'm experiencing that lately too. Like I'm not feeling inclined to snack. I'm not drinking. So it's like, mm -hmm. you, you know, I'll get like a container of beef tallow, cook with it, but it's like it lasts for like, you know, a few months or whatever. Um, and then like, OK, some eggs here, some vegetables here. And it's like you're not spending that much money and it's like you're healthier and all that. Um, so, all right, where was yeah, I? You might also Sorry, like, start spending like a few mm -hmm. more hours. Like, you might start spending right now with getting processed foods. Maybe you're getting uh, what's it called? You're spending 30 minutes a day preparing all the meals that you eat. If you actually have more whole foods and you're cooking stuff for yourself, maybe you'll get up to maybe an hour, hour and a half a day. But that will also translate into you having better energy during the rest of the day. So the other things that you're doing, you'll be able to do them faster. You'll be falling asleep faster and getting better sleep. So in, in the long run, these things tend to even up. Here we're speaking about cost-benefit analyses. In my experience, <laughs> fueling yourself in a better way and getting closer to that is is this something that just it just makes sense? I've I've heard very few people who actually make these decisions to cut out some of these things that we're talking about to improve their diet, get more familiar with the things they consume, who have complained or have said this is a this is a really bad decision for me to make. And there's very few people who are doing the sorts of jobs where I'm not like someone who's like a president of a massive company probably shouldn't be spending like ten hours a day like you know, right. Maybe like like three hours a day, like preparing this food. I understand shifting that to someone else because that time is spent doing other things that might be helping many other people and themselves in other ways. But most people on the average sorts of things that you're doing, the things that you're doing, spending leisure time or extra time, if you invest some of that time, find some way to invest that into feeding yourself, feeding your family, feeding your loved ones. It's it's the, one of the best things you can invest with time-wise, like in my estimation. Well, well said. Um, so, all right. So, next section. Uh, um, I, wait, wait, I, before you get to the next section, is there going to be a part later on where you kind of explain the difference between like why, why is olive oil okay, but then like corn? Like, what, yeah. what are the oils? I think we haven't said this. We haven't said this. What are, What are the things? The regular, I mean, corn oil, of course, that's a seed oil. But which are the oils that are considered? Besides, you said tallow. You said like things like that. So, which? What's the two different? Uh, just give us some of the popular oils out there. Well, well, we're going to I'm going to get into it. But broadly speaking, there's, um, you know, the common ones, uh, Shanahan calls them the hateful eight. Let me find the name here. Oh, yeah. So hateful eight. Okay. So it's uh, corn, canola, cottonseed, sunflower, safflower, soy, rapeseed and grapeseed. So those are the ones you should probably okay. avoid. Uh, you know, again, we'll get into cooking with animal Is fat. Is seed actual seeds from the grapes? Yes, uh, but the issue is it's the heavily it's the um, re refining and the whole process of it. Again, it's not take the seeds, press it out. It's like there's so much done to it that by the time you eat it, it's way different. Okay. But so um, okay. you know, haven't we? So I start off with okay, haven't we always cooked with vegetable seed oils? No, not at all. In fact, relative to the span of hit human history, they're a very new invention. The majority of cooking was done with animal fat from the 19th century and before beef, tallow, beef and tallow and suet from beef, lard from pigs, bacon fat, duck, schmaltz. Again, schmaltz uh, is a Yiddish word, uh, typically refers to fat from fowl more generally, but usually it means chicken fat today. Um, there's a few exceptions here and there, like the Greeks and Romans used olive oil, uh, sesame oil in India, palm oil being used in tropical places, as you mentioned. Uh, Christina said where she's from, they cook with palm oil too. You know, makes sense, tropical country. Um, mm -hmm. 
So again, items like, you know, quote unquote, vegetable oil, which by the way, was a term started to make this seem a lot healthier than it is. Uh, this was created during the industrial revolution in the mid to the late 19th century. These items developed as a way of using waste products. It's like, well, what else are you gonna do with cotton seeds after you pull off the cotton? Grape seeds, same thing, you squeeze out the juice for wine. What else are you gonna do with them? Um, you can either plant them or find something else. Uh, so they figured out, okay, we can use this to loot as an industrial lubricant for machines and also to burn fuel for lamps. Now, if you, <laughs> if you, if you, yeah, if you look up vegetable oil in its original state, and again, there's some videos we can link. Um, it's just like kind of like gray, shiny looking, bitter, funny smelling goop. And then if you look at what it is in the store, it's a far cry. Okay. Well, how did we get to that? I mean, the name Canadian comes from Canadian low acid oil. It basically, again, make it sound nicer than it is. Uh, there's a few videos where they explain there's like a 17 step process to make the oil. There's a whole thing where, you know, they grind the seeds. There's they blast it with hexane, which is used to make gasoline. There is winterizing, deodorizing. There's all this stuff, uh, you know, and it's just like. When I started looking into this, I'm just thinking to myself, like, intuitively, like, is this stuff you want in your body? Like, even it, like, okay, like, all right, I'm a lay person, I realize I'm not an expert on this stuff, but it's just like, look at all this stuff that goes into making this. It's like, is this really stuff you want to put in your body? Like, it doesn't really yeah. make sense. Like, how or why is this good for you? I mean, you know, we can talk about animal fats, but it's like, okay, it more closely resembles our fat. This is a far cry from, you know, anything. It's like, this is not remotely, remotely natural. And it's like, I remember one of my Facebook friends posted a while ago. They're like, I looked at a video on how vegetable oil was made. Watch this. You'll never eat it again. And it's like, I'm kind of at that point because it's like, yeah. again, it's so far, it's so far removed. Like, like it just, it just seems logically you want something that's like two, three steps from like the farm to eating it. It's like, this is 17 steps and add on. I'll get into heating it over and over all these other problems. It's like, this doesn't seem like stuff you want in your body. I mean, you know, <laughs> what, what do you think? Yeah. There's a, like you said, there's a reason people don't show some of these things. There's, there's yeah. certain products that the advertising for that product is like, look how we make this. There's no oil products. There's no oil company. It's been like, look at our factory. Even when you look at the shows, like um, the how it's made type of shows, I'm trying to think, have I ever seen like an oil one? There probably is one because they just do like all kinds of factories, but you don't really see that too often because, yeah, like the goop and that stuff. It's also kind of the thing with like the chicken mug nuggets, pink slime type of thing is the thing that's kind yeah. of hidden, but then certain aspects of like they, they don't hide really how Don's French fries are made because it's delicious and it's spray and stuff. But yeah, so there's a kind of process to do it where it's it's just the knowledge of what are you intaking into your body why do so many steps need to be done to convert something to something you can eat that was taken take something that's already edible like a corn count kernel and then put it through 17 steps to get it back to being edible it's like why why do all of this when instead of doing that you could just buy the chicken that's not been skinned and then before you actually f cook your chicken up just put the skins on the and cut out the fats from it and put it on there and actually have cook the chicken in the chicken fat like well, why can you do that instead well at mcdonald's actually cooked their fries and beef towel up until about 1990 or so but then because of the reasons we'll get wow. into they were basically yeah they were basically pressured and now they switch i think they use so soybean oil now i'd have to check um Peanut oil is one of those kind of in between because the thing with the peanut oil is peanut oil in of itself isn't bad. The issue with a lot of the fried stuff is that they cook it over and over and that's when the oxidative compounds build up. So like if you had a personal okay. if you had a personal fryer at home or you like sauteed with a little bit of peanut oil, it'd be OK. But the issue is if it gets heated over and over and those things build, accumulate, the more you cook with it. So. Uh, certain companies like Five Guys, I know, fry their fries in uh, the peanut oil, which again is better overall. But again, it's the issue of cooking it over and over. Um, so I would, you know, I would still be it, careful. Yeah, oil also goes bad. Like if you have, but people don't normally keep oil long enough for it to go bad. But it can actually go rancid in of itself. Yeah. So um, let's see here. So the hateful eight. I already mentioned that. So in. In 1898, corn oil was starting to be used as a commercial cooking oil. By 1902, 36 million gallons of corn oil were sold per year. Crisco was invented by Procter & Gamble, which started as a soap company, by the way, in 1911. The name uh, comes from crystallized cottonseed oil. That's where Crisco comes from. It was marketed as a better, cheaper uh, alternative to lard. In 1912, 2.6 million pounds of it were sold. In 1945, 1.3 
billion pounds of soybean oil was produced, which superseded cottonseed oil. It's estimated that the U.S. population went from zero vegetable oil consumption to about six tablespoons or 80 grams per day between 1900 and now. Um, thoughts before I get into what uh, lipids are and the different fats? Yeah. No, it's just, as you said, these are people who are just looking to create a product out of something that they're doing already. It's, it's not like some evil thing to poison the population. But then also with some of these, I wonder how you can also check like how many people producing cook, like these kinds of oils also personally consume this kind of things. It's, it's also something I'd like to look into. Yeah. Well, I, I think two of what um, I think two of what my uh, baking instructor at school, uh, Chef Hagen, said. Um, he, he we maybe we can post a picture of him. I still have my uh, photos from that class. He, uh, we were talking about making pie crust, and he was saying how historically the best uh, pie crust is made from lard. One of my friends said the best is actually leaf lard. I think it's the fat around the pig's kidneys or so because there's a certain density to it. So it, mm -hmm. um, it makes a very flaky crust when you bake it. And uh, he was saying a lot of people use Crisco, but then he was saying, like, you're not going to take Crisco, put it on a piece of toast and eat it. It's like that's not appealing. And then it's like if you follow that to the logical conclusion, well, in yeah. the current – in current era, you would use butter, but it's like butter tastes nice on toast. Well, you would want that in your pie as well. It's like, and then it's like, why not just take this conclusion and you know extend it? <laughs> yeah, that's that's partially why I like like ghee and coconut oil. It's some of the reasons because it's like I can use it, like a wide range of things, not like things I'm like okay, that's not what I'm going to use that on. Like yeah, yeah. Oh. Uh, all right, so um, oh, yeah, so but you've done like, you've gone as far as like this is something I haven't done yet, but I probably would contemplate trying you've gone to like using like uh like duck fat for like popcorn and having like more savory type of thing like that you know, like bacon fat could use things like that with like popcorns and things like that but yeah yeah well because well because i make the duck confit duck confit i mean we've talked about it but for those who don't know it's um confit classically is something simmered and cooled in its own fat and duck is a popular item for that because duck obviously has a lot of fat on its own so you cure the legs, you simmer them in the fat, then you cool the legs in the fat. And the idea is between the curing and the cooling in the fat, that's basically what kind of preserves it. And then you pull the leg out of the fat and you can either roast it. Uh, some people pull off the meat, shred it up, mix it into things, all that. So between the curing and the cooking in fat, that's how it lasts. But I save the fat because the flavor from the cure runs out into the fat. And the cure I use like uh, salt, sugar, cinnamon, allspice, fennel. So the fat kind of tastes like that. So then if you cook mm -hmm. other things with it, it absorbs those flavors as well. It's really nice. And, um, you know, I've, I've used beef tallow and popcorn. I recently did the coconut oil and uh, maple one. Uh, you know, it's, it's fun to play around with these flavors. And as I sort of got out with the Crisco point, I mean, these fats on their own actually have a good flavor. Crisco doesn't taste like really anything on its own. These yeah. flavors actually taste good on their own. So like if you cook, I've done the beef tallow fries at home. They actually taste like meaty as well as a roasted potato. It's a great flavor. Otherwise, it just tastes like, you know, nothing. Um, all right. So I wanted to get into, OK, so what are what lipids are? What is the hydrogenation process? You've probably seen hydrogenated oils. And what is the difference between saturated uh saturated monounsaturated polyunsaturated and trans fats so lipid simply refers to an oil or fat um an oil of course is liquid at room temperature a fat is solid now saturated fats are solid unsaturated are liquid so the items we associated with saturated fats again i say i say associated with because none of these items are pure saturated fat but like beef tallow, lard, duck fat, et cetera. Uh, those are a mix of saturated and monounsaturated fat. Um, and you can kind of tell because the thing is, pure saturated fat would have the texture of, let's say, hard candle wax. So if you picture a candle, like, let's say a candlestick yeah. or something, it's it's rocks, it's pretty solid. Like you would need like a saw or serrated knife to cut through it. Um, that would be a pure, a pure saturated fat would have about that texture, whereas, tallow even if it's super cold it's it's hard but it's it's soft enough that you could take a fork or spoon and like press it like cut a piece out of it um so again lip most li every lipid fat or oil tends to contain a bunch of each so like even olive oil which is mostly monounsaturated has some polyunsaturated um every every lipid contains a bit of each it just leans more in one direction or the other so we can find a diagram, but uh, polyunsaturated fat or uh, PUFAs, as Dr. Shanahan likes to say, this is quoting from her book here, 
They have two or more adult, more double bonds, hence the poly, the two molecules. Here are the most common PUFAs found in canola oil and other vegetable oils. Uh, here they have linoleic and linolenic acid. We'll get more into this below. If a fatty acid has two double bonds near one another, the molecule becomes highly susceptible to an attack by oxygen, particularly when it's heated as in processing and cooking. If it has three double bonds near one another, as linolenic acid does, it's even more vulnerable to an attack by oxygen. The products of these oxidative reactions are, so, are damaged distorted molecules that make vegetable oils so toxic. So again, um, Monounsaturated has polyunsaturated has two or more of the double bonds that gives more areas for the oxygen to squeeze in and damage the fat. And we'll get more into the oxidation issue and antioxidants below. Uh, so monounsaturated has one, so it's susceptible to the same issue, but it's not as bad. Again, it has one instead of two or more. Olive oil has a lower smoke point, so I, I often say olive oil is better for either like a light saute or cold. Uh, like I cook it with spinach personally. Uh, mono and saturated, sorry, avocado oil is also mono and saturated too. Avocado oil has a higher smoke point. So avocado oil, you could do a steak or something in. Uh, it's It has a little bit of a flavor, but it's more on the neutral side. So it's not as prominent. Um, animal fats and also uh, coconut as well as mac macadamia nut are mostly saturated with some mono and saturated. I haven't used macadamia nut oil yet. I'd like to, um, I like macadamia nut, so I would like to give it a shot. Uh, palm oil is saturated as well. Uh, again, olive and avocado are mostly monounsaturated, some poly. Uh, fish oils and seed oils are predominantly polyunsaturated. Now, where are trans fats found? Well, scientists wanted to find a way to make items like cottonseed oil closer to the texture of butter. In chemistry, there's two ways to do this. You tanger the molecules together or you make the individual molecules more stackable. So tangling them together makes the texture closer to plastic obviously you don't want to put something close to plastic in your pan and melt it down so <laughs> they want it they wanted to uh make it so naturally occurring fats exist in a cis formation so just remember cis is natural trans is unnatural so <laughs> they engineered a transformation of the fatty acid <laughs> <laughs> so, so again, quoting from Shanahan, they engineered a transformation of the fatty acids in the oil, ironing them almost flat with a with heat, pressure, hydrogen, hydrogen gas, and a nickel catalyst. The key to making the product appear edible was the catalyst, which prevented the molecules from tangling up into plastic. When the oils get squashed flat in this process, their double bonds change from natural, bent and flexible to something stiffer, and thus trans fat was born. So again, it's like, how do we make this closer <laughs> to resembling animal fat? Yeah. So again, trans fats don't exist in nature, but are created through the hydrogenation process. Trans fats and other toxic compounds are also produced when the polyunsaturated fat is heated. So which are the best fats to cook with? Well, the predominantly poly polyunsaturated fats, hand hands down. Again, quoting Shanahan, thanks to their shape, saturated fats have no room for oxygen to squeeze in, and even high high heat can't force these tough molecules to be more accommodating. Monounsaturated fats have room for just one oxygen molecule to sneak in, but it's not easy. So monounsaturated fat-rich olive oil resists the harmful oxygen-induced molecular arrangements and is still okay to cook with. Polyunsaturated fat, now that's another story. Polyunsaturated fat has two places where oxygen can chemically react, which makes oxygen not twice as likely to bind, bind with the fat molecule, but billions of times more likely. Um, so it's a combination of the initial process when they make it, but then also heating it over and over. More oxygen keeps coming in, and that changes the compound of it. Um, and so again, um, saturated fat, if I remember correctly, I think the animal fats are about it's a little more saturated, but I think they're a little under half monounsaturated. So there is some room for oxygen to squeeze in. I mean, there is oxidative damage done to animal fats, but it's a lot less. Um, so it's like you're not going to escape it entirely, but just logically, if you cook more with animal fats, there's going to be a lot less of it. If you cook with poly, there's going to be way more of it. So your risk of causing these problems is far less likely with the animal fats. Again, beef tallow, uh, lard. There's also camel fat you can buy on Amazon. I haven't cooked with it. Duck fat. Um, but then, of course, with mono, it's kind of the in-between. And then these oils, the polyunsaturated is really high risk. Okay, thoughts before I continue? Yeah, yeah you mentioned that camel fat. I had some camel milk the other day and just, oof, that stuff is strong. It's like, I don't know what, it's, I don't know how to explain it. It's just, it's just no. <laughs> <laughs> I might try some, like, camel milk-based cheese, though, just because cheese is amazing. But no, it's not, not the camel milk. 
Uh, but yeah, um, it's again, it's just like what what is this? What is the stuff we're putting into our bodies? Um, it, I think this is going to be one of the things that we look back on, like you know, in 50, 50 years, sixty years, people are going to be like, what, what are people doing? And like, as, as you're saying, it's just people just didn't have the information. This were things that we were trying out, and uh, once upon a time, there was a lot of things that we just don't do anymore that uh, people did without uh, people used to do. What's the, the lobot- lobotomies used to be a t- typical thing. Electroshock therapy used to be a typical thing, where they're just like people in the scientific community had that's the information they had, and that's what they were telling. There was consensus that that's what you're supposed to do, and um, but the consensus itself is not part of an actual scientific process. It's, it's a result of, of different things, but it's not. Um, yeah, it's 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 it's, it's unfortunate. I, I just wish you had, some of this information was more available earlier than, than it, it's been made yeah well because some, some of it too just intuitively now like i'm just like when you you break a lot of this down you realize to a degree i don't i don't always like this expression but it's common sense because it's like again animal fat for example you're fat so you assimilate a lot of it but then it's like this stuff there's so many things done to it so many chemicals and things is this stuff you should be putting in your body it's just like not enough people are asking these questions in my opinion you know? yeah yeah all right, so uh, next section here, um, talking about heart issues, the American Heart Association and the heart attack epidemic, which inspired switching to these oils. So in 1912, the first heart attack was correctly identified by a man named James B. Herrick. Um, again, there's evidence he's existed for a while, but like he actually understood this is the heart acting in this way. In 1924, the rate of heart disease, which was previously very rare, started rising. This is when the American Heart Association emerged. It was a tiny organization initially with um, no real power influence. It was basically a team of cardiologists that got together and said, let's study this, see why this is an issue. In 1948, Procter & Gamble, again, makers of Crisco, gave the American Heart Association $1.7 million. And this is in 1948, so this is, you know, several million today. (laughs) <laughs> and they even they they even they even documented this and they said in their own history book something about uh they were the recipient it was some Procter and Gamble radio contest or something they even said the money came pouring in overnight so the AHA went from kind of this backwater in organization with no power to actually a serious force um so you know when you want to look at they always talk about who's funding it it's like follow the money well okay they got their start from the makers of Crisco they're telling you their product is heart healthy so in 1955, President Eisenhower had a heart attack. Now this caused a panic because, I mean, not only the president, but also the big hero who won World War II. Symbolically, this was very crushing to a lot of people. Now, Ike, my understanding, he was a really heavy smoker. Like, I'm trying to remember if it was like a pack a day or something. So, there, you know, there's other issues, too. But at the time, it was, it was the whole thing of we need to do something. Let's do something. This is something, you know. <laughs> um, so in 1961, the American Heart Association came out and told people to replace saturated fats with, un- with polyunsaturated fats. Uh, the rate of heart attacks peaked in 1968 with heart attacks counting for 37 percent of deaths. Something had to be done. So we're going to get into a gentleman named Ansel Keys who spearheaded this and sort of led us on the current path we're on. Uh, did you have any thoughts before I continue? Uh, just, just again, just seeing the unfortunate nature of the, the reactionary nature of the state and uh, the centralized kind of plans where it's people like against other companies have malign influence on people by using money that goes through the government somehow being in an institution that the government is somehow the general public votes in people that are not subject to the malign influence that money has where it's in the private sector it's it's unfortunate that people put their trust in these organizations and the people who are well-meaning study and learn and then think this is the way I need to be able to actually help the people by going to these institutions. And it's just, it's just an unfortunate part of society where we've had so many things where I think we could have improved on and we could have developed ways to do things in a better way. But because we have this... Um, this unearned trust in certain institutions that they're the ones who are doing, or that's the best way it could be done. We kind of don't develop, oh, the government's got that. Oh, the, the scientists were, oh, there's a consensus in that, when in actuality, it's not quite what it is. So it's just good to double check in, in the information age, 
you have the access to this, double check, why do you trust X, Y, Z? Why do you believe ABC? That's something that's that's good for... So you're just talking about using the technology from the information age to bring in the age of understanding why you believe things instead of just believing that people say what they believe is true and tell you. Consume and regurgitate information for you. Yeah. Yeah, because there was a channel I looked at called Nutrition Made Simple and I like the guy's approach to a degree because like he's very good about like I don't attack you know, motives, I don't attack character, all this. And like, he's pretty good about presenting different studies and addressing points. Um, and like one thing he does well is he examines the funding, but then in a few of the videos, he's kind of like, oh, this one is government funded. And I'm just like, what does that mean? And it's like, you know, yeah, it's government funded, but who, yeah. who funded those politicians campaigns? And it's like, you're kind of perpetuating the problem if that's your mindset, because it's like you act like the government is this. It, it's the thing I always say about like, oh, it's it's the government isn't this sacred entity full of people that put aside self-interest. Mm -hmm. It's politicians who get funding from major companies. So if they give funding to studies, well, who's funding them? And it's just like, I, I don't know why you would think this is just some neutral objective thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and some of the people who will, who will accept it in certain aspects will object to it in things like the the military-industrial complex. It's like, yeah, look, there's actually a clear influence into this. You can see why this is affecting that way. But then when they look at education, when they look at the FDA, when they look at these other things, they don't make that same connection. And it's, it's odd how that, how that happens. All right, so now I want to talk about a gentleman named Ansel Keys. So he was the professor of physiology at the University of Minnesota. Um, he launched the modern dietary era in 1953 with his publication of atherosclerosis, a problem in newer public health. Now, we should point out here that he's not he wasn't a cardiologist or even a medical doctor. He had a Ph.D. Uh, studying saltwater eels. His nutrition cred credentials came from the fact that during World War II, he came up with a small package meal called a K ration, which he named after himself. Right. Now, I bring this up because I don't like to appeal to authority, but this is the era we always hear trust the experts, the experts. These people know better than me. Well, this guy wasn't even a medical doctor. He had a PhD. So it's like, why is he your ultimate authority on what to do here? Um, so in 1953, the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations had collected dietary information from 22 different countries. Now, he designed a chart to illustrate that countries that had higher rates of saturated fat, that had higher rates of fat, saturated fat consumption, um, had higher rates of heart disease. Now, he did a sleight of hand here where he only picked the six that fit his narrative. So it's like, Oh, look, these six countries, lower, lower uh, saturated fat, lower heart disease, higher, higher rates. But if you look at the actual chart with the 22, it's all over the place. It's, you know, some consume a lot of saturated fats, low rates, some consume less, higher rates. You know, it really varies a lot. Like um, in one of these books, they mention how the Swiss are actually one of the longest lived people. Swiss eat plenty of fat. I mean, you know, milk, cream, cheese, meats, you know. The Japanese actually, although they're lean, they have plenty of cholesterol because shellfish, for example, are uh, higher in cholesterol but lower in fat. So they get plenty of cholesterol. They don't have cholesterol issues. So you got to, you know, you got to question some of this stuff. Um, so his basic thesis was increase saturated fat, increase cholesterol in the blood, that clogs the arteries, and then we have heart disease. And this is the root of sort of like, oh, cholesterol clogs your arteries. Oh, if I drink fat, it's like dumping fat down a sink, it cools up, hardens, and then that kills me. You know, we know now that's not true for reasons I'm about to get into. So people forget that Keyes' work was criticized since day one, and he basically said, I'll show these guys, and basically, you know, he wanted to prove he was right. Um, naturally, of course, the margarine oil producers jumped on this, and they used it as an excuse to push their products. Uh, even at the time, it was shown that heart issues – um, while heart issues were becoming more common, dietary diets high in animal fats decreased chances of every other cause of death. In 1970s, it was becoming understood there was a serious connection between smoking and heart issues. There's some interesting stuff about uh, the little Austrian man with the funny mustache, how, um, I don't know if you know who Otto Warburg was, but there was a Jewish scientist that was actually in his employ that studied uh, cancer. And the thing was, Hitler actually allowed him to work because um, he was that hell bent on resolving cancer. Because for those who don't know, his mother died of breast cancer and they he wondered if it would affect him as well. Like they actually said that when he had different health problems or things, they would actually find a medical dictionary nearby, turn to a page on cancer. So he was almost obsessed with this because he didn't want to get it and he didn't want to um, he didn't want to die the way his mother did. So he was and, you know, he loved his mother. So he he was hell bent on solving this issue. So there was something about how Warburg was even classified as being uh, 
only part Jewish, so he was acceptable. Like that's how hell bent he was on this. He was willing to hire a Jewish guy. And then there was stuff in there's stuff I had talked about in a uh, previous video about how um, he actually basically said, like, you're going to find me evidence that smoking causes cancer. And sure enough, scientists in Nazi Germany figured that out. Like, you know, and their science was right. Later, a Marxist scientist took the findings, said it was his own. So that they all ended up being right, but in a funny roundabout kind of way. And um, I don't know if you know, but also the physician that actually treated uh, – his mother, he was actually allowed to flee the U.S. before the flee to the U.S. before the war and everything. So he he actually made an exception for him, even though he was Jewish as well. So there's some weird stuff going on here where uh, he actually made exceptions for certain people because he was just hell bent on treating cancer. Uh, did you have any thoughts before I continue? Mm -hmm. Yeah. This, yeah. This 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 thing of like uh, going back to the past and taking credit for oh this one woman did this thing so we should thank all women or oh this black well, this black man did this so like black people should be thank this. So here I was talking about if it's positive to thank an entire group of people because of what one of those members did in the past, should we thank all the Nazis today because Hitler through coercion had his doctors figure out some connection between smoking cigarettes and cancer? It stays within them. Don't 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 take the um, stolen valor. And I'm also not going to um, I'm not also going to slime you with like uh, shifted uh, decrepitude or whatever. Know, this is some, some bad term. I don't hold you responsible for the bad things your ancestors did, and I also don't praise you for bad for good things your ancestors might have done. But yeah. Uh. So, okay, getting back to it. Uh, so we know that heart attacks are caused by atherosclerosis. At the time, again, it was believed the deposit of cholesterol in the artery walls. We know now it's the inflammation of the arteries which causes cholesterol to get lodged in the arterial walls. Um, and again, just intuitively, it's like people were not dropping dead of heart attacks in the past. The French are eating all this duck fat, lard, whatever. They're not dropping dead of heart attacks. What does that tell you? Now, he was right to acknowledge that there is cholesterol, that saturated fats do raise cholesterol in the blood, but there's also different types of cholesterol. Your, your body does require cholesterol for basic biological functions, such as carrying nutrients which repair the inflamed or damaged arteries. Now, Dr. Sally Fallon made an analogy using police and crime. Because a lot of people hate the police, I'm going to change the analogy to use firefighters. Uh, Think of the inflammation in your arteries as all these fires burning, uh, which actually is kind of it kind of fits because inflammation comes from the Latin word inflammare to set on fire. Now, the yeah. cholesterol is essentially all the firefighters coming to the rescue to resolve the problem. Well, saying the cholesterol is what's killing you, that's like saying, oh, all the firefighters coming is what's causing the fires. No, the firefighters are emerging as a reaction to resolve the problem. It's like the cholesterol is trying to repair the damage in your arteries. But the question is, why are the arteries so damaged in the first place? Yeah. It's not firefighters are causing fires. It's why, why are the fires emerging in the first place? So this is quoting from another one of our sources, Scientocracy. That's the one where I found out about the thing with Hitler and smoking. Um, the doctor, what was his name here? Uh, Keeley, uh, Terrence Keeley, I think is his name. Uh, there's at least three different types of circulating blood cholesterol, one type. Uh, so-called HDL, high-density lipoprotein, is positively healthful. It draws cholesterol out of the arteries. Another type, L LDL, large, low-density lipoprotein, is largely neutral. Uh, people have said that if you look at, if you have that and you look at it under a microscope, it looks like clouds kind of going through your arteries because it's neutral. On um, the third, SL, L, SLDL, uh, small, low-density li lipoprotein, that's the one that kills. This, especially in its oxidized form, is what lodges in the arteries. Um, that, of course, makes the inflammation worse, and that get, that's how we get atherosclerosis. So saturated fats tend to raise the circulating levels of the neutral LLDLs, while the carbohydrates tend to raise the SLDLs. Therefore, it is the carbohydrate that actually raises the bad cholesterol, although we're still fully understanding the mechanism. Um, again, that's from Scientocracy. So your body absorbs 99% of animals' fat, which makes sense. It's closer to our own. The brain is mostly composed of fat. Breast milk is fat, uh, cholesterol, et cetera. Um, obviously, the composition of heavily processed oils isn't something that occurs in our bodies. Now, even before the in the 1920s, the scientists tried to show that uh, high cholesterol in the blood causes atherosclerosis. The problem is the study's flawed because they basically pumped serum cholesterol into the arteries of rabbits. Well, rabbits are herbivores. I mean, their bodies aren't designed to dig, break down cholesterol because they don't eat it. I mean, they eat plants. Um, I posted something recently about herbivores will occasionally eat meats, like they eat uh, 
dead animals and the theory is that they're eating bones to get the calcium if they don't get it from other sources but it's really bad for the animals and they're doing it more out of desperation it's not a naturally occurring thing um so then again quoting from scientocracy we can state currently with certainty that it, it is that atherosclerosis is an inflammation of the arteries of which there are many possible causes including insulin resistance and raised levels of sldl but also includes smoking stress hypertension aka high blood pressure diabetes and aging as well as inflammatory diseases including arthritis lupus chronic inflections and inflammation of unknown cause another inflammatory disease that can cause heart attacks is peptic ulceration so that's the um, back to that's what causes stomach ulcers, which is caused primarily by infections with Helobacter pylori, uh, and that because there is an association between H. pylori infection and atherosclerosis. Therefore, importantly, therefore, we still cannot know with certainty what is accounted for for the epidemi epidemiology of heart attacks in the 20th century. Now, I would argue we know now a lot of it's these oils, a lot of it was smoking. Um, again, stomach ulcers, I would have to see how common those were, but there are there were other factors. There, you know, it's not 100% oils. They've shown that the high sugar consumption, again, raises the SLDL. So, you know, there's definitely different factors going on, but it's not eating animal fat, because again, why wasn't this an issue previously? Now, Key's, Key's experiment had an Achilles heel even to the layperson. So his human lab experiments, he didn't use butter or even animal fat. He used hydrogenated margarine, which, by the way, is now banned in places like New York here, um, which contain a whopping 48% of trans fats. So margarines do contain saturated fats, which are created during the hydrogenation process, and Key's use this to attack saturated fats. So Shanahan makes the analogy... It would be kind of like saying, oh, look, my experiment proves that milk kills rats and then putting poison into the milk, the rats die and saying, oh, look, my experiment proves this. Well, no, you have to leave you. You have to ignore that there is something in there else in there. Um, now, Shanahan has a section about how uh, the lipid scientists have dismantled a lot of what Keys have said. There was an Austrian uh, lipid scientist, unfortunately passed. His name was Gerhard Spitaler. You can still find some of his articles. Maybe we can provide a link. Um, now, she makes the point that it doesn't get attention because a lot of people aren't that really interested in lipid science. Like when we hear prestigious surgeon, we tend to think brain surgeon, heart surgeon, plastic surgeon. It just, a lot of people hear, oh, you study fats in a lab. It's not that interesting. So that's why it doesn't get the same level of attention. But people like Spitaler, they they did some serious work and they showed, no, what Keyes was saying was bunk, basically. Um, now I wanted to get into, was Keyes right about anything? But did you have any thoughts or comments before I no, continue? No, right about <laughs> nothing. <laughs> um, it's, just, it's just, again, just, just seeing how, how many things that like, we build entire structures of society on. Like I, I don't think I'm, I'm necessarily that special. I just like think this, there's a wrong thing in the society to be just saying like er, gassing people up like you're, you're special, you're special, you're special. But most people are going to be average. Most people are, are going to just live their lives and not really have that big of an effect in the future. Yes, you can have a massive effect, and you do have a massive effect on your children. You are their gods. You are their future. You are their creators in that sense. So I think that's why that having kids and things like that is one of the most glorious things a human can do. But in greater societies, it's crazy how many things where it's just like one guy invented this thing, and then from that person inventing it, you see like an explosion of things that they just built off of what one person did. Or like one woman did discover this other thing here, said this thing, it was accepted, and all of a sudden like all things are based on it. and it's like one flaw into this that flaw gets baked into society for such a long time so all these people coming in with positive intentions are working on a foundation that's kind of that's it's not actually legit and then you get this situation where something all of a sudden breaks and then they have to go back and restart the whole thing and that's one of the positives about living in the world that we live in today this is why i'm very against censorship say this information share information be allowed to question everything because we have things being developed where we can kind of nip those things in the bud before we build like entire castles and edifices and cities off of these like faulty like faulty foundations by people who are not saying are evil this china guy was not an evil guy but he made some mistakes and you can also see here he also said some some things that were correct so you can i think you can tell us these correct things and we'll probably finish it off with this part and then uh, do the rest of it in the next part Sure. So um, was he right about anything? So he was a big proponent of the Mediterranean diet. He actually visited Crete. That's the island off of Greece. Uh, it's been shown that this is a healthy diet. They have a lot of olive oil, so monounsaturated fat, lower carbs, low alcohol. If they have alcohol, it's usually some red wine. I mean, Greeks, I know, drink ouzo and things. But like in general, I think the Mediterranean diet says very low alcohol if you do have it. And then uh, red wine, they've mm -hmm. talked about certain 
antioxidants. I mean, it still is alcohol, so it's not the best thing for your brain and other organs, but in moderate amounts, certain things may be beneficial. Um, they do get a certain amount of saturated fat from lamb, goat milk, cheese, et cetera, though, so it's not, you know, purely mono and saturated. Uh, he wrote several books on the topic. He followed it himself and lived to be 100. So, I mean, you know, obviously, like, you know, he lived a pretty healthy lifestyle. Um, I'm not sure what his seed oil consumption rate was, though. I mean, again, there could be various genetic factors and things. It's hard to say. Uh, but, you know, as far from what I know, uh, the Mediterranean diet's a pretty healthy diet. So if, you know, if someone wants to go on that, I mean, I definitely think that's a good idea. Um, I think, you know, they've talked about, too, there was something I was watching about uh, certain wheat in Italy that the wheat is less processed than some of the stuff here. So that's why their pastas are better for you and they don't get yeah. some of the same issues. Uh, again, the olive oil, it was funny. I was talking to our beverage director uh, last night about this. I was talking to him about this subject, the, the general different fats and all this. And he was saying uh, how in Italy, in the north, they use a lot of butter, but the olive olive oil only extends to about Liguria or so in like kind of the north. like It's like the northern part of Italy, kind of like on the coast. And he was saying uh, civilization ends where olive oil stops or something, and the French just use butter, and then there's like the animal fats and stuff. But a lot of that's just kind of a jab at the French. Um, <laughs> but it's like, uh, but you know, there is something, there is something to that. I mean, obviously, you know, they have pretty good outcomes, uh, life expectancy, all that. So, um, you know, there again, there is some mythology because like they, they do have lamb. There's lamb sausage and things. So I, I think you'd have to get like a good breakdown of how much is the mono and saturate all that. But I, I do think uh, there's merit to the Mediterranean diet. So if anyone is on that, you know, I'm curious to see how what outcome they've had. I think they're I think, you know, it's definitely for the good. Um, so, you know, this is one of these things he was right about. Just, you know, I wouldn't take everything he says as gospel <laughs> for the reasons we yeah. just discussed. Uh. Yeah. Yeah, and of course, also don't take anything we said as gospel. Uh, it's going to be we're going to try to share some links to some of this research that Stephen has done into this. It's stuff that he's done. He he was doing some of this research before taking the uh, the the choice to to cut the oils out, and it's benefited him in his life. I've mentioned also myself that things have benefited. What are some of the things that you think um, that you might have thought of that other people might have some basic things that you think keep people from making the decision from, from switching it out and cutting some of these things out and going off. Well, uh, well, I think, it, I think in general, the whole misconception about, Oh, cholesterol clogs the arteries. Cause like, I still have this with my father where like, I'll be eating this and be like, Oh, how's your cholesterol or things like that. But again, it's like growing up, that's what you were told. And Shanahan even says that in her book. She's like, I basically believed, Oh, it's, you know, your your veins and arteries are like pipes, and when you eat animal fats, oh, it fills up clogs and that kills you. But it's like, we know now that's not the case because we've examined this under microscopes. These lipid scientists like Dr. Spitaler um, have done some work. So it's like, and I understand, I mean, it's like, you're invested in something for so long, it's hard to admit that you were wrong. Like, the other thing I've said about people who are wary about rare and raw stuff, and I can show them all the science saying, no, if you handle the food properly, it's fine. Like I've been eating rare and raw stuff for well over a decade. If it killed you, I would have dropped dead long ago. Um, but again, it's like, oh, if you yeah. were told growing up, don't do this, don't, you know, and then it's like you have emotional connections to your parents, you idolize them, you don't want to go against them. You're, it's just an ego invested thing, whatever the case. So I think in general, a lot of it's just ego. Uh, people are afraid of change. Um, you know, it, it could just be that. I mean, I, I don't consider that rational. I mean, I try to change based on new information. Um, I try to listen to what the naysayers on this topic say as well. Like a few of them have pushed back saying, OK, if you, you know, even, even some of the naysayers have said, if you cut out these oils, I don't oppose you doing that. It's just don't don't eat. Don't make up for it in another way. Like, don't don't get rid of these oils and eat like pounds of butter because it's like you're still <laughs> running a calorie surplus. And like, and, and again, I mean, they do make valid points and you know, you still, I still listen. I've listened to vegans. I've listened to carnivores. Like I'm trying to get like a bigger picture view to see, okay, do these people have merit? Um, but I think in general, I think people just have to keep an open mind. It's tough. Cause I mean, nutrition and stuff changes all the time. I mean, one year it was like, eggs, are, eggs are great. Then it's, Oh, yeah. eggs are worse than smoking. And then it's now eggs are the perfect food. And it's like, I understand it can be misleading because you have all these different special interests. And Terrence Keeley, one of the authors of Scientocracy even made the point, like, look, there's no perfect solution. I mean, there's corruption with pu public or private enterprise, but the idea is that if there's competing interests, it's like, okay, this group funds sugar, this group funds fat, this group funds animal fats, this group funds oils. So at least we can hear different narratives and people can decide, does this work for me? So like, one friend said, maybe you and your family, 
Ian, maybe some of these other people, they've had some uh, genetic issue with the oils. And one of that, well, I think it was a nutrition made simple guy said they found that people with certain genetic markers are actually more prone to inflammation from the oil. So maybe I'm in that camp. I don't know. You know, again, I haven't delved that deep, but it, you know, but it's like different things work better for different people. Different people are shorter on different things. They need more nutrients uh, in that area. Like, you know, it's, I think we just, we can't, there's no one size fits all. We all have to just do our own research and see what works for me, what isn't working. And, um, you know, just keep an open mind. Yeah. yeah, and I think that's one of the few things that actually make me consider doing those like DNA things. I know you've done it more for like ancestry and things like that, but yeah. of course we just know this people will eat a bean and die. For most people, eating a bean is something that's going to kill them. So there are some of these DNA tests that can go in and actually see what does your body break down well, what does your body not do. I remember the first time I'd heard about this, I don't know if this is myth or something, but uh, there was this football player, Ricky Williams, from like the Texas, it was a, it was a Texas Longhorn running back. It was way back in the 90s, I think. I just remember when he was being drafted by like, the uh, New Orleans Saints. I remember him talking, having an interview. He was like a super jacked guy. Like, he ended up kind of falling off like marijuana and other things but he was a super jack cut guy one of the top uh, running backs I think he won the highest runs here but then i remember him talking that he'd gone to some nutritionist and talked to them and done like a blood work thing and they figured out that for some reason his when he eats broccoli his body doesn't really break it down well and transfers it to, to fats and things like this but he could just eat things like ice cream and his body's breaking down so these are things that are personally you need to go out there and test just don't let other people just <laughs> other people just consume things and regurgitate after it actually get more familiar with the things that you're putting into your body get more familiar with how those things are made and i think it's just going to be a positive thing in general for you uh but yeah so uh do you have anything well, else to say was, before we close off for this part I, when we get back one of the things that are left we're going to be discussing yeah yeah one thing i should mention about shanahan i mentioned how she was a nutritionist for the uh lakers and i mean that's when lebron was playing she's not oh she doesn't hold that position anymore but one of the things she did was she made them cut out vegetable oils so i wonder if any of lebron's performance is from uh cutting out vegetable oils it'd be an interesting i mean you know to see here was talking about how lebron james made the great investment of spending over a million on his body a year and, uh, like his body at least that's one of the infamous things he's famous for and i do remember it was two or three years ago he actually i don't think he was doing keto in particular but i think he did that for at least one summer to to get to because in his earlier seasons of course he was, he was a lot younger he was playing a lot heavier i think he used to play it like 265 but he's also like 68 <laughs> 610 but now he's playing at around 235, I think, around there. So there was a time when I think he did keto to really cut down these things, and he's built for me. And there's a lot of things in sports science that actually just go into – I, I know it's, it's a game. I know it's not as serious as life. Say I'm a warrior, things like this. I know some people put too much interest in the actual competition aspect of it, but there's a lot of positives from professional sports when it comes to, like, the medicinal advances that are spent from – people investing that much money because these athletes competing earn that much money. So they have the amount of time to actually invest in. And then the things that are done in sports science very often uh, trickle into like the science and medicine that are being used for like the regular folk and regular people. And those are people who, of course, like you see them with their diets down to like exactly eat this time. This thing is, yeah, it's, 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 it's an interesting thing to look into. And I think on an average level, regular people, especially if you're living in the West, you have some time, you have the time to listen to this. Here, just decrying our tendency to have this access to information and still make the choices to not use it, not benefit from it. Yeah, and, and my my thing too, again, it's like obviously I believe in freedom and it's like people can do what they want, but like my my thing would be like if you had any of these issues, like, you know, we'll get into it more below, but like you have issues losing weight, you're moody, um, you feel sluggish, all these other things – you know, try cutting them out for a bit. Just see how you feel. Like, do it for, like, a week or something and see, like, do your cravings for junk food go away? Do you have more energy? Do you, like, like, for me, like, part of it was also cutting out alcohol, but, like, I could feel my body burning its own fat. So, again, part of that's cutting out alcohol. But it's, like, in general, I just feel better, more mental clarity, uh, more energy. Uh, I've been noticing lately, too, my uh, – I think I posted a video or a Facebook post about it. My uh, my my vision's been clearer, and I'm wondering if that's in part because I've been using the uh, blue light blocker uh, both on my phone and computer, and I have the glasses as well, so like my eyes aren't as strained. And uh, Christine was telling me that her her eyes would sometimes get red or feel strained, and since she's been doing this, like her eyes feel way more relaxed. So that could be another factor as well. I mean, again, I'm willing to look at all these factors, but 
I can say what I've been doing has been working so far, so I'm going to stick with it unless, you know, someone can convince me otherwise. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's crazy how there's how many people in this is probably a significant population in the West that has never actually has has never actually starved, has never actually got to a point where their body is actually getting fuel from the stores in the body. It's always been they've always had access to external calories, so they're always just running off of fuel that they put in from other places and of course that's where that extra stuff always they've in their entire life they've never been at a caloric deficit it's it's crazy to kind of think like that with a vast range of people when majority of society majority of evolution majority of animals spend majority of their time in caloric deficits searching out their next meal and like things like that but being like i do i have enough should i do the risk of spending these calories now because I'm going to be able to obtain enough calories by this caloric expenditure to last me to the next time I can get it. But for humans, some of us now, it's just not even the thing. It's just like, yeah, food's going to be there. It's going to take these things. Regardless, let's give it to me. Well, Shannon, Shannon even mentions, I think, in uh, one of the books that, like, even you think about, it, like, issues relating to excess sugar, uh, historically, they only affected the wealthy because sugar was a luxury item, so it's like... You know, you're only going to get it if you have money. You're going to eat way too much if you're ultra rich. Well, that's a handful of people. So I always make the point, like, I can walk around the corner and, like, I can get, you know, I can go to the 7-Eleven, get a big gulp or whatever. I'm like, that's more sugar than my ancestors had over several months. It's like, you know, that's that's why. It's like this stuff in excess is just so bad for you. I mean, it's it, you could say it's unhealthy in general, but it's just, like, the amount of access we have and the fact that people – consume way too much anyway it's like you know it's just crazy <laughs> yeah like i wonder how tied that is because in like you with that thing that's often repeated where uh until like the industrial revolution with like the discovery of things like uh getting energy from oil and things like from fossil fuels and things like this was like 95 percent of the population used to be somehow involved in agriculture or food in production and manufacturing and spreading around so people had a lot more knowledge of that and just for the entire society most most other earthlings have to physically exert themselves to obtain food work you have to work in some way to eat if you don't if you don't work you you don't eat like that was a common thing but then maybe you get into certain societies where that's no longer connected to it and then that's also shifted to other aspects of work like why do i need to work for anything else in my life if the basic thing that used to drive us to work used to exert ourselves of gaining resources is no longer a thing maybe our, our minds are kind of like if we don't have to work for that why should I work for anything else that's not completely directed to these things that used to be more like separated, like you're doing all these things so you can get enough money to get enough resources to obtain like the actual food. And maybe there's like a disconnect there. I don't know. But I think that disconnect can also be reconnected by the abundance of food that you can already get, get more knowledge how to prepare it, what goes into it, the different options that you have. Because as we've talked about in the various You Are What Consume series and the series with like the restaurants, there's just, it's, it's just so odd for me to be living in, in the state and still just be like, I'm just going to eat these basic things that are just in front of me. People talk about food yeah. deserts, but yeah, it's a food desert, but then I can also go online and like order these games or shoes or things from like countries away to be shipped to me. But I'm complaining because I don't have the ability to go online and order like farm fresh meat from like a, a, a farm, like just a, a county across from Like, no, no, you don't, you don't have an excuse because you could do all these different things and actually improve improve your life but yeah okay yeah i mean that's all that's all i have so, to say um, for now we'll we'll get it we'll get into the inflammation the antioxidants pro-oxidants all that below um some of the other side effects i've shown from eating these oils but i think you know this is a good place to stop so okay so yeah uh first of all thank you all for listening uh guys gals and everybody else in between and uh, steven thank you very much for doing this research we've been talking about doing this for some time and uh Find you some time in your busy schedule and then get into this and just, uh, but of course, there's also going to be links to Stephen's uh, social media. He's doing a lot of very helpful, shorter videos. His little lady, Christine, she also does a lot of things with the cooking. You can follow them in that journey as well. I might start posting some more things with like the Chef New Top. So we'll leave links there to our different socials where you can find information. And most of the research Stephen has done for this presentation to come talk to us, we'll also make that available for y'all to check that. And also, as we mentioned, if you have anything else to give to us, please send it in and maybe just throw this in one location where y'all can uh, get all that information. But yeah. Yeah. Sounds good. Till right. next time.
Goodbye. Bye-bye.